Hello, John Serrato here, coming to you from the parsonage of the First Baptist Church in Manchester, New Hampshire, continuing our study in the book of Romans. I hope you've been with us all along and uh, following along, and <clears throat> if you have a Bible you want to turn to uh, the ninth chapter of, of Romans, and we've been kind of hanging around one section here, and uh, yeah, last, last time we spoke about uh, the man's freedom uh, to say yes or no to the Lord and how God works through us by our lives, uh, hopefully to encourage people to listen to the gospel and hear it and, and hopefully respond to it by God's grace. But uh, today I'd like to talk to you about, about Israel uh, because that's what Paul's talking about in this chapter and, and the lessons that Israel was taught, some they learned, some they didn't, the lessons that God dealt with Israel with, these lessons included correction and chastisement when they needed it. And the Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And the word chasten, it comes from the word chaste, which means clean and pure and holy and good. So, so the point of chastening is God is trying to deliver us from the things that hurt us namely sinful things, as the Bible calls them. We don't call them sin so much no, anymore, but they still hurt us. The consequences are the same. The wages of sin kill something. It's death. And, and so, so God is wanting to deliver us from those things. And, and he does so when we know him and we belong to him. Now, this is for Christians. You belong to Jesus. And he uses everything that touches our lives especially the unpleasant things or the bad things or even the tragic things. He uses them for our good. We read that in Romans chapter 8. All things work together for good to them that love him, them who are called according to his purpose that they might be conformed to the image of his Son. So he's wanting to make us like Jesus, which is the place of total blessing and his protection, his care, victory, peace, eternal life. That's what, that's what it's about. And, and, but as Christians, many times we get drawn aside. We're weak, and we get tempted, we get blindsided, we get uh, you know, attacked, and we, uh, and we get in the, on the wrong path. Maybe just in our thinking. We're not thinking right. We're not feeling right toward others. Uh, maybe we're actually doing things wrong or failing to do things we should. All those things are negative, and God wants to deliver us from them. So sometimes, in order to get our attention, he has to use problems, troubles, pain. And, and that's called chastening, chastisement, correction, really. And he says, whom the Lord loves, he corrects, he chastens. Listen, like a father who delights in his children. Like a father who delights in his children. So no chastening for the present seems, seems pleasant. But afterward, the Hebrew writer says, it yields the peaceable fruit of holiness. So no, no, no chastening is, is a joy. It's never fun. You know, it's like, like the Olympians. The, the, the people who win the gold medals, you know, up to the time they won those gold medals, they worked themselves almost into the ground, getting up early before school, practicing for hours, 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 and, and it, 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 was, it, it wasn't fun. It, it's hard work. And, and so uh, that, that's, that's sort of, it's worth it to get the gold for them. But like Paul says, that's a perishing crown. We are working for an eternal, permanent crown forever with the Lord. Not a literal crown, but the rewards and blessings of God forever. And, and there is that choice we have to surrender to him and let him correct us when we need it. And thank him for it. And, and, and it's good for us. And that's hard to do when we're hurting Hard to do when it makes us feel like God's mad at us or he's against us, but he's not. It's, 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 he's a, it's a father who delights. And, and if, he's, if you're going through troubles and problems, you need to ask the Lord to show you Romans 8.28. 
that he's working all things together for your eternal good because he loves you. He delights in you. See, that, that, that's tough stuff. But the Spirit of God can help you if you're willing. If you're willing. Now, if you just want to fuss and complain and growl and, and whine and moan and talk to all your friends and get on the phone and complain, no, it, that's not going to help any. <laughs> that's not going to work. Now, you, you, you need to surrender to him, not to the trouble. You do use your brain, try to do everything you can to solve the problems, but sometimes only he can deliver us. And he will when it's time. So I want to. I would like you to, if you're, if you're, if you happen to have your Bible and you like to follow along, uh, Isaiah chapter ten uh, is is a key passage. And in Isaiah chapter ten, uh, we read something that happened to Israel that is a, a a clear lesson to us about how God chastens us and how He uses things around us to straighten us out, to correct us, and so forth. And, and it starts with um, uh, chapter 10 of, um, of, of um, Isaiah. Okay, <laughs> so uh, in, in this chapter, he, 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 let's see, we start with verse 5. Now here's the prophet, God speaking through the prophet. And of all things, He's speaking to Israel, but, but he's speaking for Israel, and it's written to Israel, but he's speaking in this picture language to Assyria. Now, Assyria was an empire that was totally cruel, extremely evil, totally greedy and ambitious, and they were up north of Israel. And as long as Israel was obedient to the Lord, Assyria couldn't, couldn't take over, couldn't take them, didn't even try. It's amazing. God protected Israel as long as they were obedient. But then they started adopting the ways of the Assyrians, the idolatry and sin and lust and all those things. They started worshiping false gods, unbelievable when God was so good to them and he was blessing them down there in the promised land Israel the northern kingdom of Israel and 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 they turned away from the Lord and the Lord let let troubles come and problems and tried to get their attention but they continually refused and here's what he says about Assyria he says oh woe Woe, that's bad. Woe to Assyria. And then he describes Assyria, and this is why woe is going to come on Assyria. But meanwhile, before the woe comes on Assyria, God is going to allow Assyria to bring woe on Israel to chastise them, to get them to turn from their sin and go back to God. So here's what he says. Oh, woe unto Assyria. They are the rod of my anger. The rod of my anger. So the rod of his anger is how he whips, whips somebody. He punishes them. And he says, they're the rod. And the staff in whose hand is my indignation. God was angry with Israel because they were totally evil. They were getting saturated with evil. They were just acting like the heathen around them. And instead of converting the heathen, they were being converted like the heathen. And God hated that because they were, because he loved them. And, and when you love your children, you hate it when they get into bad things. You don't hate the children, you hate the bad things. And that's what God was, he was angry. And he says about Assyria, I will send him against an ungodly nation. Israel had become ungodly. And God says, I will send them. Now, did he actually send them? No, they didn't even know God. Assyrians didn't believe in the God of Israel. They had their own gods, and they certainly didn't get any messages from God. So how did God send them? He just took away his hand of protection from Israel, and Assyria did its own thing. And it was like it was released to attack Israel. And, and God says, I sent them. See, this is something you've got to be careful of. In the Old Testament, 
there's what we call double agency, double agency. And God uses certain agents to do their own thing. And they do it, but it serves his purpose. They don't even know it. They don't even believe it. But that's how infinitely wise and powerful God is. He uses their wickedness, their own motives, <coughs> whatever they were, to bring about correction on his people. So he says, I will send him against an ungodly nation, against the people of my wrath, and will give him charge. It's, it's like he's, he, he, it's almost like he's directly directing them which he isn't. They're doing their own thing. Why are they doing it? Because they're greedy, they're mean, they're selfish, they want to they wanna gobble up all the territory they can. They're not thinking of pleasing God. They're not thinking of chastising Israel and making them better. They want to destroy them. But God says, they're doing my will right now to correct you, to put the fear in you so you'll repent. And he says, to seize a spoil, to take a prey, and tread them down in the mire of the streets. And then he says this about Assyria. He doesn't mean so. See, it's not, it's, he's not meaning to do my will. He doesn't mean to chastise Israel. He says, he, he, he in his heart says, he says, I just want to destroy. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? How clear. He says, but in his heart, it is to destroy, to cut off all the nations. See, so God just stops protecting Israel and allows natural things to happen. He is not, he is not controlling Assyria. They're controlling themselves in their evil. But he monitors it. He controls it. He limits it. He directs it somehow, and they don't even know it. And he's using them to correct his people, to deliver his people from their sin. He says, I want to cut off a nations. And then he goes on and says, my princes are like kings. In other words, we're the best. This is Assyria talking. He says, look what I've done to Carchemish, to Arpad, to Damascus, to Samaria. Samaria is going to be the same. Samaria was the capital of Israel. So he lists all his conquests, Assyria does. He says, I'm going to get, and, and he, he goes after them. Uh, and, and they... Assyria thinks, they think, they're all in control, they're doing it, they, they're winning, they're going to get what they want, and yet it's God doing two things. One, he, he uses them to straighten out Israel, to eventually turn Israel around. I mean, they have to go through a lot, they get scattered, they get taken, all kinds of stuff, but it's to cleanse them and purify them and chasten them and correct them. That's the whole point. That's the first reason he allows Assyria to, to, to attack Israel. The second reason is, he says, I want to judge Assyria for all their evil. He says, I'm going to judge Assyria. That's why he starts off this passage by saying, woe to, Os to Assyria. Woe to Assyria. Bad things are going to happen to you. Why? It's going to be even worse for you because you attack my people. And you say, well, he let them do it. He says he direct. Yes, but they, they're evil and they're going to pay. And the ultimate sin is for them to attack the people of God. So God says, he says, it shall come to pass. Now get this. When the Lord has performed his work, correcting Mount Zion, correcting, using Assyria to punish his people and straighten them out, he says when he's finished his work, he says on Zion and Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the stout heart and arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and his glory and his haughty looks. So what is God saying? He's saying to the Assyrians, I'm going to use you. You don't know it. You have no idea. You don't even know I'm here, but I'm going to use you. And then after I'm done using you, I'm going to punish you 
because that's exactly what you deserve. They've been horrible to all the nations around them. He says, by the strength of my, Sirius says, by the strength of my hand, I've done it. By my wisdom, I, my prudent, I've removed the boundaries of the people. I've robbed their treasuries. I, 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 I open my mouth. They didn't open their mouth. And then God says, isn't that interesting? He says, shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? <laughs> is the ax going to say, oh, I'm chopping this tree down? No. See, he's saying, I use the Syria like an ax. And Assyria is bragging that they're who they are, they're going to do all And he says, but you're going to get it. He says, and so forth. So what's the point here? Well, the point of this lesson is this, that God uses things that are not good in this world. And there's plenty of them. They're all over the place. There's disease. There's, there's, there's accidents, there's, there's relational problems of anger and hate and bitterness. There's, there's all, all kinds of things. There's uh, a bankruptcy, losing your income, getting fired. There's, there's, you can list a whole ton of things that can go wrong in our lives. And God says for his children, anything that goes wrong, he's using to make us better. It's not necessarily, well, you did something bad. Like Israel, they were evil. You don't have to be evil as a Christian. Sometimes God purifies us and moves us along and increases our trust in Him and our faith and our power by using troubles and problems to draw us closer to Him. Here's the key. God loves you. He knows you personally. The hairs of your head are numbered. You're, he sees every sparrow that falls. You're like, you're worth many sparrows. <laughs> Just Jesus' way of saying, God gives you his full attention. God gives you his full attention. And he loves you and he cares about you. And his goal is to bless you and make you more like Jesus. Now, if you stray, he'll correct you. He may have to chastise you. But even if you don't stray, he knows what it takes to keep you from straying. He knows what it takes to keep you close. He did that with Paul. Paul said, God, he prayed over and over and over that God would take away a physical affliction that he had. And then Paul realized that he needed that because he had a tendency to be arrogant and proud, and it was his nature and God knew what it took to keep him from that. And he had, and God says, my grace is sufficient for thee. My, uh, my, uh, my uh, strength is made perfect in your weakness. And he said, Paul, just stop asking me. So Paul says, therefore, I will glory in my infirmity. For when I am weak, I am strong. He got it. He said, I guess... I'm just the way I am, and God need, knows what it takes to keep me close. And if it takes trouble, I'll take it, because I want to stay close. It doesn't matter what it costs, I want to stay close. Boy, I'll tell you, if you've got that spirit, you cannot lose. Father, bless this word to every heart, I pray. Thank you for your faithful, loving correction. Thank you for moving in us constantly to give us your best. Oh, Lord, help us to just trust you with all our hearts and lean not to our own understanding, to acknowledge you in all our ways, Lord, that you may direct our paths. Thank you, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen.